Hi, today I thought I'd try to do something a little different. I'm going to go ahead and do a little video here. In working through our lesson this week, I realized you might benefit from seeing a method of doing stoichiometry problems that I learned back in high school. Um, I've been using this method of uh, ratios and proportions um, for a lot of things in my everyday life, and it's really a very, a very good way of um, doing math problems. So let's take a look at it. So wh uh, why use ratios and proportions? Using ratios and proportions is a convenient way of organizing mathematical information. It, it's a very logical system. Um, once you get the hang of it, it makes a lot of sense. By setting up a proportion, you can determine an unknown quantity quickly and accurately. And once you become comfortable with it, you can take a lot of shortcuts, get, get done very fast. The ratio proportion method has many applications in everyday life. You can use it in cooking, in your art projects. If you're building a house, you might have to convert measurements. Um, you can calculate how long it takes you to get from San Diego to San Francisco all sorts of uses, as well as for chemistry problems. If you haven't used ratios and proportions in a while, let's go back and just review what they are. A ratio is simply a comparison of two numbers, such as the number of apples on a tree. Let's say for this given uh, variety, there's an average of 335 apples on one tree. That gives us a ratio of 335 to 1. A proportion is taking two ratios that are equal to each other. Um, for example, if there's 335 apples on one tree, we can expect that there's 1,005 apples on three trees. These two ratios are equal to each other, and therefore it is a proportion. You can use proportions to find unknowns. This is a big power of it. You can, um, if you want to figure out an unknown, simply substitute a variable. In this video, I'll be using the variable x, which is pretty much the standard for algebra. Say you're a farmer. You have five apple trees of, a no of this variety, and you want to know how many boxes you're going to need to buy to hold all the apples in. So, if there's an average of 335 apples on one tree, how many apples can you expect on your five trees. Let's set up the ratios. 335 over 1 is equal to x over 5. You notice that the units are the same on the top and on the bottom of both sides of the equal sign. Then what do you do? You cross multiply. Cross multiply just means that you take the, multiply the number on the top left with the number on the bottom right at the same time, you multiply the number on the bottom left with the number on the top right, both sides of the equal sign, um, and those two numbers will actually be equivalent. So, in this case, x is equal to 5 times 335. x is equal to 1,675 apples. Therefore, you will need to buy boxes that can hold 1,675 apples for your trees. Does it matter if you decided to flip the ratios? Well, let's take a look. Instead of putting apples on top, we put trees on top. So for one tree, the, the relationship is still the same we can still expect 335 apples. But instead, we'll put five trees on top on the right-hand side over x apples. Then let's cross-multiply again. Once again, 1 times x is equal to 5 times 335, so we arrive at x equals 1,675 apples. The answer is the same. This is the part of using ratios and proportions that I really think is beneficial. If for some reason you flip the units, it doesn't matter for the because the answer will come out the same. As long as you keep the units on both sides of the equal signs in the same position, the unit on the top, on the top, and the unit on the bottom, on the bottom, the same, on both sides, 
It doesn't matter whether that's on the top or the bottom. You can flip them. So that's a very powerful part of using this method. So let's apply this to chemistry. Remember a couple weeks ago we had some questions about masses and moles and number of atoms, all those conversions we did in that lab? Well, you could have used this ratio and proportion method for those problems. For example, we had questions like how many moles are in 14 grams of aluminum? If you remember how we found the molar mass is we simply went to aluminum, looked it up on the periodic table. You could convert the AMU atomic mass units to grams. It's roughly 27 grams per mole. And remember, molar mass, you know, if you remember this, will be very helpful. Molar mass is grams per mole. That's basically a ratio. Okay, so now let's set that ratio up. If there are 27 grams per mole of aluminum, we can put 27 grams over mole on the left hand side. That's our first ratio. Now we look back at our question and fill in. Uh, we want grams on the top. We're given 14 grams, so put 14 grams on the top. And we are looking for how many moles. So we have x moles. We put that on the bottom. Now our two ratios are proportional. Let's find the answer. Go ahead and cross multiply. We have 27x is equal to 14. Divide through by 27. This is simple algebra. You get x is equal to 14 over 27 moles, or x is equal to 0 0.52 moles of aluminum. Let's remember that answer for the next question. How many atoms are in 14 grams? grams of aluminum. Whenever you see the word atoms in a question, immediately think of Avogadro's number. That should just pop into your mind 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms in a mole of aluminum. There is your first ratio on the left hand side. You've got atoms over moles. What are we looking for in the question? We want to know how many atoms. So atoms go on the top, x atoms on the top, on the right hand side ratio. And if you remember, we're looking for moles now on the bottom. In our last equation, we figured out that there was 0 0.52 moles of aluminum and 14 grams of aluminum. So we can substitute that in. And now we do cross, uh, cross multiplication and that comes up with x is equal to 0 0.52 times 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. That's a simple calculation. We find out that there is 3.13 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of aluminum in 14 grams of aluminum. There we go. That wasn't too bad, was it? We can also use it for mole to mole conversions. If you're given this equation for an electrolysis of water, we have two molecules of water um, breaking down to form two, one molecule of oxygen and two molecules of hydrogen. Now, the question is, if we have 15 moles of water, how many moles of oxygen could be made by this electrolysis process? When you're looking at this type of mole conversion, first of all, make sure that you're dealing with a balanced equation. If it's not balanced, go ahead and balance it first. But I see that this one is balanced. Now you can use the coefficients in front of the equation to figure out the moles. So for every two moles of water in this equation, we can expect one mole of oxygen. So set that up as your ratio on the left-hand side. 2 moles water over 1 mole oxygen. Now let's go back to our question, our problem, and uh, fill in what we know. We have 15 moles of water. Well, 15 moles of water goes on the top, and we are looking for how many moles of oxygen, so moles of oxygen goes on the bottom. Now simply cross-multiply. 2 
times x is equal to 15. And so we divide through by 2. x is equal to 15 over 2. And so therefore, x is equal to 7.5 moles of oxygen. Great. That's how many moles we can expect. We can also do mass-to-mass -mass conversions. You will notice in the chapter on this for this week that some of the chemistry equation conversions will require setting up multiple ratios. There will be ratio after ratio after ratio. If you think that this starts to look like spaghetti and you're not quite sure where, what, which one needs to go up and which one needs to go down, if you break it down, use the proportions, it will help keep all those numbers straight. Also, just remember, keep a strict eye on the units you've been given and the units you're looking for, and those will help you set up your proportions. Let's look at a more complicated example. If you're given the neutralization equation, in other words, an acid-base reaction, magnesium hydroxide plus hydrochloric acid is going to go to water plus magnesium chloride. In this problem, if we have 5.50 grams of magnesium hydroxide, how many grams of hydrochloric acid can be neutralized? So let's take a look. What are you given? You're given the moles of the reactant from your equation, as long as your equation is balanced, which it seems to be. Okay, that's the moles of reactants, again, are the coefficients to the molecules. You're also given the mass in grams of magnesium hydroxide. That's in the question. And you are able to find the molar mass of any of the molecules in the equation by going to your periodic table. Remember, molar mass, grams per mole. Okay, let's go take a look. I've left the equation and the problem there on the top of the slide. So look down at the middle there, that we'll, that's where we'll get started. Step one, how many moles of magnesium hydroxide is 5.50 grams? Well, this is one of the equations we just did. Um, so let's take a look. We go and we find our molar mass by adding up the AMUs for each atom uh, uh, from the periodic table, and I got 58.32 grams. Your periodic table might be slightly different, so you might come up with a slightly different number, but it should be roughly about that. And we know molar mass is grams per mole, so our ratio on the left-hand side is already set up, 558.32 grams per one mole of magnesium hydroxide. Okay, then we can go back to the problem. We're looking for how many moles of magnesium hydroxide, so that's our X. Um, looking at, on the left-hand side, we see that that um, needs to go on the bottom of the ratio. And we are given 5.5 grams. Grams is on the top of the ratio. So now we have our proportion set up. Let's go ahead and cross-multiply. 58.32x is going to equal 5.50. And so therefore, you have to divide both sides by 58.32. And you come up with x is equal to 0.094 moles of magnesium hydroxide. As you'll notice, you don't really need to hold on to the units through the calculation. The um, proportion will tell you what the answer, uh, the units of the answer is. That's one of the shortcuts of this method. So, step two, how many moles of hydrochloric acid will react with the number of moles we just figured out of magnesium chloride, zero point, oh, excuse me, magnesium hydroxide, 0.094. So let's look at our reaction equation. We see for every mole of magnesium hydroxide, the coefficient for hydrochloric acid is 2. So we're going to have 2 moles of hydrochloric acid. So it's pretty straightforward. So let's set up that ratio. Now we're looking for how many moles is going to react. So we need how many moles of Hydrochloric acid is our x value. Moles of hydrochloric acid is on the bottom of the ratio. And we figured out in our last calculation there's 0.094 moles of magnesium hydroxide that goes on the top 
of the ratio. Proportions are now e equivalent. We can go ahead and cross multiply. X is equal to 2 times 0 0.094. So X is equal to 0 0.188 moles of hydrochloric acid. We're almost there. We just have to convert now the moles to grams to find out the final step in the mass conversion. So step three, how many grams of HCl are in 0.188 moles? So what do we do? We go back to our periodic table and we figure out the molar mass, we're thinking grams per mole, of HCl. We find out it's 36.461, at least that's according to my periodic table, grams per mole. That sets up our ratio. So we're looking for how many grams, so that's X grams, in 0 0.188 moles of hydrochloric acid. So that goes on the bottom, grams on top, moles HCl on the bottom. Our proportions are set up correctly. Let's do the cross, cross multiplication. X is equal to 0 0.188 times 36.461. X is equal to 6.85 grams of hydrochloric acid. There we go. It took three steps, but we uh, were able to use the information from the equation and from our periodic table um, and, and just work, work through it um, pretty confidently that we have gotten the um, units correct. So there you go, that's the method. So in conclusion, I think using ratios and proportions is a simple but very powerful way to find unknowns when you're making these multiple conversions. All you need to do is pay close attention to the units in the problem. You set up your proportions accordingly, make sure the top, what's on the top is on the top on both sides, what's on the bottom is on the bottom both sides, and then simply cross multiply to solve for your x. Um, I hope that was helpful. As with many things, it may not the method that works best for me may not be the me method that works best for you or is the most logical for you. If you need to, there's many many videos and tutorials on the internet of ways to do uh, stoichiometry problems. Um, almost as many different ways as there, there are uh, chemists, chemists to show you. But um, hopefully this, you'll find this helpful. If you have any questions, you know how to get a hold of me, either email or uh, to the Yahoo group, or you can leave a comment on the blog. Um, and um, if not, I will see you in lab next week. Thank you.